for those of you who have gone through this before, you probably realize why it is a rather difficult task today. And for quite a while, really didn't want to do this at all. <laughs> However, I knew this has, you know, one day I have to do this. And um, once I decide I have to give this lecture, I start to look back my career, what I have done so far, and made me realize how fortunate I have been to have enjoyed working with so many wonderful mentors, colleagues, collaborators, students, and postdocs. So it made me feel a great pleasure actually here today to share um, with you my journey, you will see why it's zigzag here a little while, uh, into what I'm working now, which is uh, trying to figure out some of the um, mechanisms or their working principles of cellular nanomachines. So this is my proper zigzag title. <laughs> so my life, or really a child who started in China, in the middle of China, um, in fact, a place called Daxian in Sichuan, and that's where that uh, arrow is pointing. And um, it's a very typical Chinese middle-sized town, crowded, polluted, <laughs> um, jammed in, and, um, but surrounded by agricultural land and also beautiful <coughs> nature around it. I was, uh, um, I basically grew up during, during and immediately after the um, Cultural Revolution. In fact, I was born the year Cultural Revolution started. And so my early childhood in a society which is very isolated, had no material possessions, but we lead a very happy and simple, innocent life, in fact. Um, but fortunately, that ended when I was 10. So my school years were spent just post the Cultural Revolution, and, uh, which was a great time because the deprivation of education and knowledge during the Cultural Revolution, that gave the society a great drive to really respect and strive for the education and, and knowledge, and the intellects and the education are greatly respected. So it's that environment I really spent my school years. So everyone was aspired to achieve academic excellency. That was a thing with, which is most appreciated, unlike the modern days. Um, and also the teachers, because they were deprived of the right to teach during the Cultural Revolution for 10 years. And after that, they really put all their effort and dedication into educating us. So here's just a few pictures. Probably my children haven't seen them yet. Starting from when I was five and growing up until I was 17 or 18 there. So I did quite well. I was one of the probably model students at the school. And, um, did very well in the so-called uh, nationwide college interest exam. Consequently, I got a place um, through quite competitive uh, um, examination and got a place in the, one of the top universities in China. So for the first time, I took a train journey, over 30 hours train journey, and traveled from um, Daxian to Beijing. And in fact, I've taken this train journey so many times through tunnels and mountains. Um, you know, very crowded train off and there's no place to sit, but everyone was very happy. <laughs> <laughs> As I pretty much summed up my, summed up my childhood. Hard working, nothing but happy. Um, so the next four years I spent in Peking University, which we would say is definitely the number one university in China, although the next door, Tsinghua would argue differently. Um, it's be considered to be the um, harbor of the Orient. It's a beautiful campus, and it's one of the, it is the oldest university in China, and um, it's known for its academic excellency, also for its freedom among the freedom of thinking among the students. In fact, all the modern Chinese new movement started in Beijing University, including the one about 20 years ago which most of you probably have heard of. So here's me proudly showing my parents around the campus where I was in university. 
So again, I sailed through the university for years. Not really embarrassing or <laughs> to report, I think. <laughs> and uh, but I was again sailed through quite uh, did very well. So I was offered a place to stay at the university. Um, I was chose to major in nuclear physics. That's because during my school years, my preference of subject was math, physics, chemistry, and biology. <laughs> so physics being the closest to math, but um, a little bit uh, closer to real life. So that's why I choose um, nuclear physics instead of uh, pure math. And so I was given the opportunity to stay there to continue my postgraduate studies. However, like many Chinese um, students then, China just started to open to the West. So we all wanted to really go out to see the rest of the world. And uh, so I took the opportunity and traveled um, this time by airplane, first time on the airplane. And from Beijing, traveled uh, across the uh, Pacific Ocean all the way to Long Island, New York. That's uh, where I spent my next uh, six years doing my PhD between Stony Brook and um, Brookhaven National Laboratory, which, which are about 20, 30 miles away. I can't remember exactly. <laughs> about 30 minutes drive. And that's where I joined Janus's group showing here. As I said to Janos yesterday, you have not changed for the last 20 years. <laughs> Here's Janos directing his group at the beam night. Here's me, very eager-minded PhD student there. And uh, there we are developing X-ray microscopy. So a very brief one slide introduction to X-ray microscopy. So we use X-ray source, in fact, um, use a synchrotron radiation source as a light source. So you should all be familiar with normal microscope. So the only difference here is that we use x-rays. In fact, we need highly coherent x-rays. So our beam light is one of the first undulator beam lights at a synchrotron. And then once the x-rays is generated and it goes through a number of optics, and finally it's being focused to a very fine point. And that's where we put our samples there and then record what passed through. It's basically a transmission and X-ray microscope. In this case, it's a scanning stage, so it's a scanning transmission X-ray microscope. And the key component in this whole setup is the Fresnel zone plate. That is a focusing device. And it is basically a circular gradient. And the resolution of the microscope is determined by how fine the outermost zone is. And at the time, it was fabricated by electron lithography, so the resolution is limited about 30 nanometers. For the crystallographers here, that's 300 angstroms. The operating range of the extra energy is basically between carbon and the oxygen edge. That's because between these two edges, the energy range there, so X-ray is pretty much almost transparent in water compared to biological materials. Here showing a um, penetration power. So water, you can penetrate quite long distance, while biologic samples, it has much higher absorption. So it gives us a natural um, contrast to image biologic samples in its uh, aqueous environment. So this is, would be a typical Transmission X-ray microscope images, for example, showing here is a chromosome in its uh, aqueous environment. So my project is to develop X-ray microscope, but with a twist, with chemical sensitivity. So why do we bother to do that? So here's just an image as similar to what I've shown you earlier. In this case, it's a sperm head from bull. And you can see the contrast between the biologic samples, in this case, the sperm head, and water environment. However, we know in the sperm head, for example, it's, it's mainly contains 
DNA and proteins. So it wouldn't be wonderful if we can actually separate these two chemical components using the imaging techniques. So that's basically what we're trying to do. And the features we used are the so-called near-edge um, fine um, absorption spectrum of the x-rays. So in this case, I've shown one example is a carbon edge. So you can see that the absorption spectrum of the DNA shown here is quite different from the protein structure uh, spectrum. So use these fine features. So we can take multiple images at different wavelengths. Then we can quantitatively deconvolve these two components. For crystallographers here, this is actually quite similar to matte facing. So we use the fine details at the absorption edge and use the differences there to get information which is normally lost in the diffraction or in this case the transmission. So use spectrons like this and many images similar to that. We manage to separate the proteins from the DNA and there are some fine features associated with this, which I won't go into details. Here's another image. It's, again, it's a sperm, but this time with tail. So you can see the, the tail contains large protein, which is nice confirmatory. So that pretty much sums up my majority of my PhD thesis. When I was looking back, so that's rather simple. How come it took me so long? <laughs> but I can tell you it's not that easy um, to quantitatively um, actually ob um, obtain this information. So this is in collaboration with um, Rod Bonk from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. So after my PhD, oh here just one an anecdote. So I finished my PhD, here's just the evidence to support that, that this is on my thesis defense um, my, with my um, thesis committee here. And um, for physicists here, probably recognize this name, um, Chen Ning Yang. He's a um, theoretical physicist. In fact, he was one of the only two Chinese uh, Nobel laureates for decades. So he was an absolutely iconic figure in China. In fact, he was one of the reasons, um, one of the many reasons I chose to go to Stony Brook to study physics. So I remember at, at the defense, um, Professor Yang asked me quite a lot of questions and it become more and more theoretical, um, complicated mathematical questions. And eventually I gave up. So, <laughs> so I feel rather um, uneasy afterwards. I, asked, I told Yanis about this. Yana said to me, Sheldon, nobody could ever answer all his questions. He judged students by how many questions you could answer. <laughs> So based on the number I gave Janus, Janus what I did all right. Um, so after that, I was at a um, very fortunate um, place, really. I was looking around to see what other things I might be able to do. I definitely like imaging, because for me, seeing is believing. If you want to figure out something, want to know how it works, you need to see what it looks like first. And uh, there are many different ways we can look at things. So I was at a fortunate uh, situation that with help from my supervisors, Janus, and other um, mentors around, I was all, um, provided or offered a few um, possible opportunities to continue my research. One of them is that I, in fact, develop extra microscopy at the ESRF, which I was very tempted to go there, and all continue work on the uh, sperm biology at Lawrence Livermore. And I also looked at uh, going into electron microscopy at the time at NIH, which come back later, <laughs> finally got me. And also looked at uh, some very interesting um, imaging techniques, so that's visible light, uh, but ultra-fast imaging. And finally, the possibility of looking at something much smaller with much higher resolution, that is actually crystallography. Um, so Janus um, being my supervisor, again, that's the same picture, 
look just like him now, um, <laughs> who is being an absolutely fantastic supervisor. I think the best one can hope, really. He's uh, extremely knowledgeable, well respected, but a very, very positive, encouraging, and always uh, extremely supportive. And I don't ever remember Janus telling me, Shadow, you need to work harder, but everyone in his group always feel we need to work harder in order not to disappoint Janus. So I still haven't quite figured out <laughs> how he managed to achieve that, and hopefully one day I, I will be able to do that to my students. <laughs> <laughs> so at the time, Janus has a great collaborator, um, David Sayre, for the crystallographer here. You probably have heard of Sayre equation. That is indeed the um, David Sayre, this, this Sayre here. And uh, David's contributed um, to extra crystallographer, uh, many people here know. And uh, you, some of you might not know that David and Janus actually collaborated for the last uh, 30 or 40 decades. And this is one of their um, first papers together in fact, they together um, proposed that this uh, carbon oxygen water window could be a potential um, imaging range for biological materials. And uh, they have continued to push um, the frontiers, the X-ray microscopy, in general X-ray imaging, with uh, the later contribution, including the proposal to extend the methodology of X-ray crystallography to lung crystalline specimens. And perhaps the latest development, which is going towards that direction, not quite yet, is uh, this year's publication. Um, probably some of you have seen this in Nature, is uh, using nanocrystallography. crystallography. It's, it's getting seven or eight times from electron density map. So David, being, a, being someone who's contributed to different fields in different ways, in fact, he was also one of the core members at IBM developing Fortran. And because of the success of Fortran, he was giving, awarded an IBM fellowship, which gave him lifetime freedom of um, research. And uh, so David strongly believed that as a young scientist, one should expand your knowledge as wide as possible. So David really convinced me I should go do something different, and extra crystallography is a great field to go into. So with his help, and um, in both selecting the labs for me and also introduced me to those labs, so I was uh, very fortunate to be offered a place at Harvard. So this time the travel is a bit easier in the true American capitalist style. I drove there in my own car and um, so I spent the next two years at Harvard in the laboratory of the uh, late Don Wiley. As Paul mentioned already, Don was a brilliant scientist, he was probably one of the best structural biologists at the time. In fact, his sudden death um, in 2001 um, has uh, been a great tragedy in science, he's contributed significantly to both immunology and virology. And Don actually, uh, in my view, was a brilliant um, supervisor as well. Because of my lack of crystallography experience when I joined his lab, so he used to assign me homeworks to do, that is reading the methodology papers, seratic papers about crystallography. And then once a week, he would then discuss those assignment or the findings with me, and we would discuss the methodologies, limitations, and applications. And of course, with his expert knowledge, he also shared great insight with me. So it was a rather easy transition than I thought, um, partly because it was trained by the great, uh, by a great crystallographer. So the method of choice then was extra crystallography. And um, it relies on us obtaining crystals, which are shown here. Diamond is one crystal. And if you look inside, if you can imagine you can look inside, 
It has many, many thousands or tens of thousands of molecules lined up in perfect order. So once we have crystals, we then use x-rays showing here this giant beam, um, which then hit the x-rays. And they will generate something like this. In crystallographer's eyes, are beautiful diffraction spots. But probably Sarah and Sophia would disagree. Look rather <laughs> plain um, gray spots. And from that, we can actually obtain so-called phase information, eventually give you this electron density map, and which contains the information about how the molecule might look like. So from there, you can get this beautiful representation of the three-dimensional structure as uh, you two have often seen me display on my computers. So the project I was in involved in involves flu virus. That is a virus that infects us every year, called flu. <laughs> and uh, flu virus has an envelope, a membrane. On the surface, the normal flu virus has two different proteins, and one of them is responsible for the virus to infect us. Another one is responsible for us to escape from the infected cell so that the virus can infect again. But there's one type of flu, interesting, the only contains one of these one proteins on the surface, and that one protein can carry out both functions. So it's re therefore rather interesting how a single protein can carry out both functions. So together with Peter Rosenzell, who's in the audience here, um, we solved the structure of this rather large molecule at the time. And uh, it's a beautiful trimeric structure, showing here. From the structure information, it really explains how a single protein can carry out both functions. And also, it provides a evolutionary link between the different flu viruses and also coronavirus, which is a virus called common code. So through the work there, not only I learned crystallography, the technique, and also it made me realize that all these wonderful protein molecules have three-dimensional structure, can do lots of different things. And in fact, going back, to look at, for example, the sperm image we were looking at at X1A using X-ray microscopy. So at the time, we really, I at least treated as just an envelope um, object and didn't really think what's inside. So if you look inside, it's actually the sperm head is basically a cell. And inside the cell, there's lots of things. And one of the things is DNA showing here. Sophia, are you looking? <laughs> DNA is this beautiful double helix. Even Sophia can draw that now. And also has proteins. So these have three-dimensional structures. <coughs> and in fact, cells are everywhere in our body. They make up, they make up us. For example, this would be cells of your skin if you look really close down. You imagine you have a very big magnifier glass. So you will find lots of cells crowded together from your skin. And if you imagine we can cut open one of the cells, and you will find that there's lots of things inside. So apart from the nucleus, which I mentioned, there's many other compartments inside the cells. And furthermore, those proteins I mentioned are the busy bodies inside. They carry out lots and lots of important functions. They keep the cells alive and function normally, and therefore they keep us alive. So these protein machines should be moving around. Unfortunately, I don't have a movie to show them. Are they really important molecular machines, we call them. And you can imagine that if these machines go wrong, something dramatically, terribly can happen. For example, some of them can be lethal. So some changes in the molecules can cause the cell death, and therefore we will never exist. So that's it. Some of them 
if they have changes, they can then make us become ill. For example, these two proteins with this funny name of BRCA1, BRCA2, and in fact, they are the breast cancer genes. So if we have changes in these proteins, they dramatically increase the risk of breast cancer. And another protein I'm going to introduce later is with a funny name called P97. So if there are changes in there, it causes the so-called Paget disease, which is basically a muscle and a bone deformation. And sometimes, if, say, a bacterium, one of the machinery in the bacteria have changes, they can make the bacteria very resistant to antibiotics, so therefore cause antibiotic resistance. So when these machines go wrong, different level of damage can be done. So you can see that some of them can be pretty dramatic, but some of them perhaps can be rescued. So the rationale is really, if we can understand how these machines work, we can perhaps fix them when they go wrong or use it to our advantage. So this is really what, for structural biology, what we're trying to figure out is to figure out how these machines work and eventually need us to either fix them or use it to our advantage. So with the interest in the machines and also as Paul said um, at the time and um, I decided to move to um, Britain um, partly for uh, mainly for personal reasons. Here I joined um, Cancer Research UK at the time in Pure Cancer Research Fund and that's when I first met Paul, who has remained to be a great friend, colleague, and uh, boss, has always been my boss. <laughs> <laughs> probably, will always, probably will continue. <laughs> uh, you'll, be <laughs> you'll still be my boss. Um, and so, so during that time, we I was really started to be introduced in these molecular machines. This is the one called P97 I already introduced to you and to you. That is a real one of these big molecular machines. And this molecule is rather large, has 800 amino acids, each of this single chain, and has six of them. So it's a very large molecule. I already mentioned to you that extra crystallography depends on us getting crystals. So it's not always easy. So that's when the EM comes to rescue later. But before I go into that, I want to just mention what P97 does. So like, for example, in our garden, if we have something chopped off or dead branches, we sometimes use a shredder to get rid of it. Then we can compost this. Similarly, in the cell, if these machines go wrong or Sometimes we just don't need these machines anymore. We don't need these proteins anymore. So in the cell, we also have a machinery called a proteasome to get rid of them, to recycle the proteins. And uh, this molecule P97 works in that, in assisting um, this system, that it basically help get rid of misfolded proteins when the proteins go wrong from, for example, the um, membranes and extract it out and then deliver to the recycling machine of the cell so that these misfolded proteins can be degraded. So as I said, the P97 is rather large. We couldn't get crystals at the time. So here with the help of Marine, Marine's here, and we were introduced to the methodology of electron microscopy single particle um, analysis. And this method doesn't require crystals, so you can image thousands of particles. And using algorithm developed by Marine and others, you can then obtain a low resolution structure, but much larger, you can work with much larger molecules. So you can get this envelope or shape of your molecules. And if you can get crystal structure, which has a high resolution of individual component, you can then fit them in here and will give you a sort of pseudo-atomic resolution structure of the larger molecule. So this is a technique I have adopted 
and since that time um, for my research. So after ICF, this time the travel is much easier, just across London, on the Piccadilly line. <laughs> and um, so from 2001, I've been at the Imperial College. I'm be very happy here. This, some of our group members, some of them are here, some of them are left. Um, this is also when I met my great collaborator, Martin, who unfortunately I think couldn't make it today because he fell ill. Uh, is that true? Martin is not here, which is a great shame. So Martin is really the one who introduced me into something I have really been fascinated um, with since I arrived at Imperial College. That concerns genes or DNA, which I talked a little bit about. But genes or DNA is really just a, a blueprint for a house. Nothing will happen if you just have a blueprint. So you need to make it into something. The genes are basically are the code or the instructions for making proteins. And just like a blueprint um, plant, then can be made into a house. And then, once you have the proteins, they are the work machines, then they can make cells. And then when you have houses, you can form communities, and villages, um, and or cities or the countries. So the critical step here is from genes to proteins. And there's a number of big machines inside cell to carry out fu that function. One of them is a machine called RNA polymerase. So this is one to read the code in the DNA and then convert it into something called messenger RNA, which then can be used to make proteins. So this is the part Martin is very interested in and has introduced me to it. So genes. This DNA needs to be turned on and off at the correct time. That process is called gene regulation. So imagine if you have sets of genes control your arm growth. Suppose it's turned on the wrong time, you might have your arm grow somewhere else. Or if it's turned on for too long or too short, you might have arm too long or too short, which is no use. So genes need to be really tightly regulated to be turned on and off at the right time. So how are they regulated? How are they turned on and off? There's many different ways this happens. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples that my lab has been studying. One of the simple methods, if you want to keep a gene off, is simply by occupying the space. Just like you know, if you don't want someone go into a road or house, you put a big gate there, and nobody can get in. Similarly, if you have a piece of gene or DNA, you don't want to turn on, you don't want the transcription machine to introduce to RNA polymerase to access it, you simply use some other proteins to occupy this space. Now, it cannot be accessed. And uh, one of the proteins we studied really undergo dramatic changes, a uh, true sort of gymnastics, in order for it to binds to the DNA tightly so that it can safeguard it, so that it cannot be turned on accidentally. And only when the cells detect those toxic chemicals in this case, the toxic chemicals will be detected by this molecule, and then this molecule will then be released from the gene, and now <coughs> the gene can be turned on. And in fact, this gene turned out to encode a protein, which then get rid of the toxic chemicals. So this is part of the antibiotic resistance um, system um, in bacteria. So this is a work in collaboration with Juan Ramas and Marin Trini. Marin is here from Spain. And another way genes can be stopped uh, from being transcribed is uh, simply by store the machines. So here's the transcription machine I introduced to you, RNA polymerase. So it can, it can bind to the DNA, but we can store it. Just like for a train, you can be ready to go on the track, but if you have a roadblock in front of it, it cannot leave. 
So how is this machine being stored then? So this is a work we've done the last few years using largely electron microscopy. So here again the RN polymerase, the transcription machineries. And what we find is that in order to transcribe the DNA, one strand of the DNA needs to go into this machine so that the genes can be transcribed. However, the passage for the DNA to go into this machine, in this case, is being blocked by another protein. So it's using another protein as a roadblock in this case, so that the DNA cannot go into the, go into the transcription machinery. Therefore, genes cannot be turned down. So obviously, this is a way to really keep it tightly controlled so that it cannot be turned down. However, there are situations where you really need to turn these genes on. How does this happen? So they use specialized machines, and these machines use a few inside a cell called ATP. And using the ATP, these machines undergo quite large conformational changes. And through the changes, it then induce further changes in the transcription machinery RNA polymerase. And consequently, this roadblock I've mentioned to you, which is showing here, blocks the DNA from going in. And now, with this machine's help, and it's been lifted off, and now the DNA can go in, transcription can start. So once the RNA polymerase starts to transcribe the gene, so here's the DNA, here's the RNA polymerase, you can see from the picture what could happen is that occasionally the RNA polymerase can fall off the track, can fall off the DNA, and that will have, have dramatic consequences as well because that means you have unfinished gene being transcribed. Therefore, you cannot make proper proteins. So cells, again, have evolved ways to deal with that. They use elongation factors. And our recent work provides explanation how these things help the RNA polymerase, the transcription machinery, to stay on track of DNA <coughs> during transcription. It uses a rather simple strategy. It's simply bridging these two um, half of the RNA polymerase, and now the DNA is being enclosed inside these protein complexes. So now the RNA polymerase cannot disengage from the DNA so easily. So therefore, it increases the processivity of the DNA. So the transcription side of the work, as I said, Martin Bach really introduced me to it. And we are interested in how they are controlled, how they are turned down, and also how the elongation process happens. And currently, we're also trying to understand how the genes are terminated. So I have some great collaborators on this project. And Ray, who is here, although the work uh, with Ray I didn't talk about. And also Yipin from Peking University is here. Again, the work I didn't have time to talk about. And also with uh, Katsumiro Kami from Penn State University. Now, I mentioned the DNA is a really key for making proteins, machine, making machines, but DNA can be damaged. One of the really uh, drastic damage is when the DNA is broken completely. So just like if you have a bridge is broken, if you don't fix it, things can go terribly wrong if you're trying to drive a car or train through it. And the same for the DNA, if you don't fix it, this can cause serious problems, such as cancer. And fortunately, cells have evolved repair mechanisms and repair machineries so that this broken DNA can be patched up. So one of these repair mechanisms, one of the key components, is this protein I introduced to you earlier, this protein called BRCA2, which is a breast cancer gene and is also one of the largest proteins with over 3,000 amino acids long. And this protein does quite a lot of things. This is a rather complicated diagram. I don't expect Sophia you to remember or understand this. 
But here's the DNA, it's been broken in the middle, and it needs this protein showing in here in this green blob, and it needs it for a number of ways. Eventually, the DNA is being patched up, being fixed. So obviously, this protein is very important in this DNA damage repair pathway. So therefore, you can imagine if there are changes in this protein, this DNA won't be fixed properly, and therefore, there's dramatic increase in the risk of cancers, especially breast cancers. So in collaboration with Steve West at Cancer Research UK, we are currently trying to figure out the structures and also the mechanism how this DNA damage repair is carried out. So now, so far, the DNA I've shown you is largely in this stretched out, double-stranded form. But inside our, hum inside our cells, that's not the case because we have quite a lot of DNA with limited space. So one way to, do, to store a large amount of DNA in a limited space is like we roll off threads at home. So you have very long thread, but if you roll up into a bowl, you can store it very nicely. So it's the same principle. So DNA can then be rolled up into these bowls called a nucleosome, which then can be condensed and eventually form chromosomes. So this is great because you can condense large amount of DNA into a small space and also makes the DNA safer, so it's less damage um, to the DNA. However, this also causes problems because I told you that in order for the DNA, the genes, to be converted into proteins, you need all the different machines to carry out the function. So now your DNA is being nicely tucked away, but then it causes problems for those machines to access it. Cells have evolved mechanisms to deal with that. Here's just a simple. Um, description of, suppose you have a DNA damaged in one of your nucleosomes, and this then sends out a signal that this DNA needs to be um, fixed or corrected. And one of the large machines this, the cells utilize is uh, something called an NAT complex. And the cells recruit the NAT complex, and again, it uses the cellular fuel ATP to make changes and now the damaged DNA is being exposed and now you can recruit repair machinery to fix a piece of DNA. So this odd shaped thing I draw here is actually a very complicated protein machine, has more than 10 molecules in it and with over a megadalton um, molecular weight. So in collaboration with Dale Wigley, Institute of Cancer Research, we're currently trying to work out how this NO80 complex recognizes DNA and then eventually leads to the reprogram of the DNA position and leads to DNA damage repair. So I pretty much finished my, um, my journey until now from where I grew up. So if I look at it geographically where I have been, so I started from somewhere in China, went to Beijing, then went to New York, Boston, to England, and in fact, from 2007, I also became a visiting professor at Peking University. I pretty much <laughs> completed, almost completed my journey in 20 years. So what's going to happen in the next 20 years? I don't know whether I'm going to stay here or go around the world again. <laughs> so you have to wait until my retirement lecture to find that out. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I also did a plot of the resolution of the things I looked at over the years. So if you count nuclear physics to be zero angstrom <laughs> in terms of resolution, <laughs> and X-ray microscopy is somewhere 300 angstrom there. And since I've been doing extra crystallography, electron microscopy, and back and back, back and forth. But I'm slightly comforted that there's a slight trend of going 
going downwards, so I'm optimistic that in the next five, ten years, I will get atomic resolution of everything. <laughs> so we'll see. And um, even biologically, so I started with, without knowing too much, um, with my PhD work, by imaging chromosomes and sperm, which is related to genes, although I didn't really appreciate that at the time. And then I made uh, a jump into exocrystallography, looking at the uh, influenza C virus. And from there, I was introduced into molecular machines, such as P97, which is a continuous same with Paul running with Paul. But the recent few years, I really started to go back to do more DNA-related projects, such as the gene regulation, the chromatin remodeling, and the DNA damage repair. So even scientifically, I find myself zigzag, zigzag, but coming back seems to be more DNA processing enzymes. However, I'm interested by only interesting problems in my view, so I won't <coughs> promise I'm going to stay along the track of the gene um, DNA processing enzymes. So just looking forward, now I've said where I am now, what I would really like to do the next 5, 10, 20 years, how many I have left, is to continue with some of the projects I already mentioned. For example, this chromatin remodeling complex and the DNA damage repair and the P97 project I already mentioned a little bit and also the gene regulation transcription initiation process. Eventually, I want to convert all the shapes I've shown you here into 3D structures with atomic details and in motion. So it's a very grand scheme. With the iron polymerase uh, initiation, we actually start, this just give you a flavor of what I would like to do eventually with all my project. So this is iron polymerase. So here's, we have the sh shape already. We have the shape of this specialized machine. We also know how they get together. We also have some idea of how these machines at atomic level it moves and how the, the specialized machines induce changes in the RNA polymerase eventually leads to transcription activation. So the next five, ten years we want to convert all this either way or somewhere else well into atomic details and eventually hopefully similar approach will need to all of my other projects. So I think it's uh, about time to thank people who have contributed to all this work. So here's just uh, some snapshots of the structures we have solved over the years. But as you know, most of the structures I actually didn't solve. So it's all the people who worked with me. A number of them you can see the familiar faces in the audience. And I apologize for people whose pictures are not here. Probably either I don't have your pictures or your project have not finished yet. <laughs> <laughs> and um, as I said, during my preparation, I just realized how many wonderful people I have worked with, have supported me, have inspired me. So here's just some of the names. Again, very quickly, if you can scan your names through. Um, I hope I have covered everyone I have collaborated with uh, in, the, in the past or current. And finally, I'd like to thank my extended family in China. We have a very big family, 30, 40 people often gather together in the weekend. And they have been a continuous support throughout my life. And every one of them has been extremely helpful to me and to my two girls. And they are very kind, hard-working, aspirational people whose uh, continuous love and support really made me who I am. And also thank Chris for his support and for being a great father of the two girls here. And for Dale for his support and help and also critique of all my work. <laughs> Also, he rather goes fishing than doing all, any of those. <laughs> and to my two um, beautiful daughters, who gave me lots of grief, frustration, and <laughs> stress. 
How can that be? <laughs> but most of all, love, um, fulfillment, and joy. Thank you, girls. And I haven't finished yet. <laughs> and to my parents, who uh, unfortunately could not be here today, but really without them, it's not possible. Good or bad, um, where well, um, they made me. <laughs> Lastly, thank you all for being here with me. Thank you.